Greetings, everyone. I'm Paul Peppis, Director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. Welcome to this first virtual public lecture in the OHC's annual named lecture series. Responding to two of the most urgent issues of our moment, climate change and social justice, we've selected for this year's series the theme of climate justice. Advocates for climate justice believe that climate change is a human rights issue and that current social and political structures and environmental policies inequitably affect human opportunities and experiences amidst a, a changing climate. As with all OHC themed lectures, our climate justice series seeks to create a space for experts to share their research and knowledge and to foster conversation and understanding. Our speakers will apply their diverse expertise to topics of climate and racial justice, reparation ecology, building an equitable green economy, the interdependence between the humanities and the sciences, and for this evening, climate change communication. By applying the tools of the humanities, rigorous inquiry, critical thinking, and open discussion to the challenges of climate change and social justice, our speakers will help educate and inspire us to improve our shared human experience. Before I introduce our speaker for tonight, I have a couple of brief announcements. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the talk. If you have questions at that point, please type your questions into the chat feature of Zoom. You can access that feature by hovering over the bottom of the Zoom window with your cursor. I will moderate and ask the questions. We've also enabled the closed captioning function of Zoom. You can activate captions by hovering over the live transcript option at the bottom of the Zoom window. The talk is being recorded and will be available for viewing on the Oregon Humanities Center's website and YouTube channel. I also need to give my customary thanks. First, thanks as always to the OHC's incomparable staff, Associate Director Gina Turner, Program Coordinator Melissa Gustafson, Communications Coordinator Peg Gearhart, and our Student Assistant Kaya Freeman. During the COVID pandemic, our staff has done an amazing job translating and transferring all we do at the OHC into remote form. I've been impressed and humbled by their resilience, energy, and generosity. Second, I need to give thanks to the OHC's generous donors, without whom we could not support the kind of innovative humanities research, teaching, and public programming that we do. I'm especially excited, in fact, to alert you to a special matching gift opportunity. Supporters can maximize the impact of their gifts to the OHC, thanks to the generosity of Amanda and Alex Hauglin, who have offered to match gifts to the OHC through December 31st, 2020. You can give at ohc.uoregon.edu slash give, which we'll post in the chat box. I'm delighted now to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Anthony Leiserwitz, Director of the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication and a Senior Research Scientist at the School of the Environment at Yale University. He will deliver the Oregon Humanities Center's uh, 2019, I'm sorry, 2020-2021 Criticos Lecture. Established in 1993, through a gift from two of the OHC's generous Portland patrons, the Criticos Professorship brings to the university and to the state of Oregon distinguished scholars, critics, and leaders in the humanities. From the Greek, Criticos translates roughly as able to judge, evaluate, and criticize. As the term suggests, the Criticos Professorship was created to foster the education of UO students and faculty and to promote intelligent, critical public discourse across our state. Both our theme of climate justice, as well as the Criticos Professorship's charge to bring to UO and Oregon distinguished scholars, critics, and leaders in the humanities who promote intelligent and critical public discourse, help explain why we selected Anthony Leiserwitz as this year's Criticos Professor. Leiserwitz is an expert on public opinion and public engagement with the issues of climate change and the environment. His research investigates the psychological, cultural, and political factors that influence environmental beliefs attitudes, policy, support, and behavior. He conducts research at the global, national, and local scales, including studies in the United States, China, and India. He has served as a consultant to the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University, the United Nations Development Program, the Gallup World Poll, and the World Economic Forum. He is a board member of the KR Foundation and serves as an advisor to the UN Foundation, the Ad Council, Years of Living Dangerously, and the China Center for Climate Change Communication. He is also the host of Climate Connections, a daily national radio program and podcast. 
Last but not least, Tony Leiserwitz is a duck, having earned both his MS and PhD in environmental studies from the University of Oregon. Tonight, he will enlighten us on the topic of climate change in the American mind. Please join me in welcoming back Tony uh, Leiserwitz. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the uh, thank you so much for the introduction, but also in particular, thank you so much for the invitation. I cannot tell you how much I wish I was there in person. Um, and really, the best way to say that is just thank you, not just to the Oregon Humanities Center for the invitation, but just thank you to the University of Oregon. Uh, you know, I got my master's at U of O. I got my PhD at U of O. My mentors are all at U of O. The, my dissertation committee in the geography department, in the philosophy department, and of course, uh, Paul Slovic at over in decision research psychology. Uh, I just could not be where I was without the amazing support and nurturance I got at the U of O, which was such an incredible experience. And then I just have, I, I mean, I have so many family and friends still in Eugene, so I can't tell you how much I wish I was there but this is the best we can do given the, the circumstances. So again, thank you so much. Um, let me begin by just kind of giving you a little more detail about what I've done since I left U of O. Uh, and that is that I, I went on to uh, join the faculty at the School of the Environment at Yale University where I direct the Yale program on climate change communication. And to give you a quick sense as to what we do, uh, one is research and then the other is outreach based on that research. So on the research side, uh, we're really interested in how do mass societies at, in the United States and around the world respond to the issue of climate change? Um, so what do people understand and misunderstand about the causes, the consequences, the solutions to climate change? How do they perceive the risks? So the likelihood and severity of different types of impacts from forest fires to sea level rise to health impacts and so on. What kinds of policies do people support or oppose? What kinds of behaviors are they engaged in around climate and clean energy and so on? And when I say behaviors, we really kind of look at four main categories. First is how do people actually use waste or conserve energy at home and on the road? Secondly is consumer behavior. So to what extent will people prefer the products and services that uh, will improve uh, uh, the climate? but also to what extent are they willing to reward or punish companies for their actions? And let me just take a moment to say that at least historically in the United States, Americans have been more willing to vote with their pocketbooks, to vote with their dollars, than they have been to vote at the ballot box on this issue, though that's shifting and changing and I'll get to that later. Um, but that don't underestimate how what a powerful lever of social change that is, is to get companies to change their behavior and thereby change the economy and thereby change the larger political system as well. A third major type of behavior we look at is social behavior. So that of course includes communication. Do we talk about this issue? Or more often, why don't we talk about this issue? But it also includes the role of what are called social norms, these unwritten cultural rules that guide so much of our daily lives. Uh, and you know, I can't see everybody, but at least when I grew up, I'll give you a concrete example and that's smoking. Smoking was everywhere. If I had just taken an airplane from uh, New York to uh, Eugene, I would have been stuck in a metal tube with at least 50 other people puffing away and I wouldn't have been able to escape it, okay? That was just the way it was. It used to be glamorized, it used to be glorified. If I was sitting in front of you right now and I pulled out a cigarette and lit it, most of you would recoil in horror, okay? That's not because of laws, that's not because of regulations, that's not any of that. It's because the social norm, what we have come to expect as proper behavior as human beings living around each other and with each other has shifted so fundamentally. And it turns out those social norms are really important for climate and lots of other issues as well. Uh, and then last but not least is political behavior. So not just you know, what kinds of policies do people support or oppose or what kind of candidate do they, uh, do they like candidate X or Y, and we do work on that. But the, the area that we've spent more time on in recent years is really trying to ask what leads people to become active citizens. To basically say, I'm not gonna stand on the sidelines and watch the world burn. I wanna do what I can to get involved, roll up my sleeves and make a difference within my sphere of influence, whatever that is. Uh, you know, you don't have to run for Congress to make a difference on climate change, though if you want to run for Congress, that's a perfectly acceptable behavior. So, uh, so anyway, those are the types of things that we look at, but ultimately as scientists, our real question then is why? 
What are those psychological, cultural, political, geographic reasons why some people get really engaged with this issue, other people are kind of apathetic, and some are downright dismissive and hostile, okay? Uh, and then, uh, as was just mentioned, we work at a lot of different scales. So mostly what I'm gonna do tonight, in fact, let me just switch to my, uh, my share screen here. Bear with me for a second. Okay, and Paul, can I just get a quick thumbs up that that's working? Okay, great. So uh, today I'm gonna mostly talk about climate change in the American mind, but uh, we also study this at lots of different scales. So we've done, geez, uh, dozens of uh, nationally representative surveys here in the United States, but increasingly over in the past few years, we're doing a lot more at the state and local level because that's where so much of the action just frankly has to happen regardless of what happens in DC. Um, but also we've been working a lot internationally. So uh, we did the first ever study in China, the first ever study in India. Uh, we partnered with the Gallup World Poll for a few years where we studied this in about 130 countries around the world. Um, that's not where I'm gonna talk about for now, but if people want to go to any of those other scales in the Q&A, please, uh, by all means ask, and I'll do what I can to try to answer at, at other scales. So anyway, all of that work has developed a tremendous body of insights that we now partner with and work with through our outreach programs with lots of different organizations from governments to journalists, to advocates, to scientists and educators uh, all over the country and around the world. Um, but that also has translated into our own effort to uh, communicate directly to the American public. And that most notably is our own climate news service that we call Yale Climate Connections, which includes uh, articles that we started doing about a decade ago, uh, then a monthly video series. And then six years ago, we started a national radio program, which I'm proud to say actually plays uh, right there in the Eugene area. I think it's KERBM. Um, and, uh, and basically, I'll give you a few examples of that in, in, the, in the future, but basically it's drawing on directly what we've learned, some of the insights that we've gained from that research and using that to actually structure and uh, design the way that we tell these kinds of stories. And these are very short 90 second stories, a brand new one every day, Monday through Friday, uh, that currently play on over 650 stations across the country, uh, plus another 136 Spanish speaking uh, stations. So it's a really fabulous uh, uh, and I'll, uh, opportunity and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Okay, so that's kind of a quick uh, overview of uh, where I'm coming from. And so now let me turn to today's talk, which is climate change in the American mind. And let me just begin this by kind of putting out a proposition, okay? And that is that it would be great. It would be wonderful if all Americans and in fact, everyone around the world could have the equivalent of Climate Change 101, a full semester course devoted to here's how the climate system works, here's how, what the causes are, here's what the consequences are, here's what the solutions are, uh, you know, really understanding it. And ideally that would be a full semester course taught at the U of O and maybe at Yale as well. Uh, and that would be available for all seven and a half billion people on the planet. Um, that's never gonna happen. That's never gonna happen, okay? Now, I'm not saying that there aren't in fact millions of people around the world and in the United States who actually do want the details, okay? There are, there are definitely lots of people who really wanna get in and, and truly understand this. And I think it's an incumbent upon us in the climate community to go more than halfway to try to meet them where they are and answer those questions as best we can. But that's not most people. Most people don't have the background, they don't have the training, they don't have the time, they don't have the interest, okay? So we have to start with a recognition that most people are always going to have limited shelf space devoted to this issue, or frankly, most issues uh, in their brain. So the real question is, what would you want them to know? Let's say that there's just enough room up there for most people to have five ideas, okay? Five key facts about this issue. What would you want them to know? Is it critical that they understand exactly uh, how the carbon cycle works? Probably not. Is it critical that they understand exactly how many parts per million of carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere at any given moment? Probably not. And in the course of our own work and some of our colleagues around the United States, we think we've identified at least five key ideas that ought to serve as a baseline, right? Now, if you're a water resources manager, you need a lot more details, but that's because you're doing something more advanced. For most people, we would argue that these five things are, should be like the baseline uh, understanding uh, to be able to engage this issue as an American. Um, and moreover, we've boiled those five 
key ideas down to just 10 words. Okay? Um, now, a good friend of mine in Congress is uh, uh, loves to do haikus, so she's actually converted to an 11 word version. So I'm going to give you the haiku version because this is a humanities lecture, for goodness sake. So, okay, so you ready? Here, they, here we go. The five key ideas. Scientists agree. It's real. It's us. It's bad. But there's hope. Now that seems simple. It seems really simple. And in fact, that's the advantage of it. It is simple. But in fact, I would argue that these are actually uh, very, what I would call meta ideas. These are, in, there's so much below the surface of each of these, which are conclusions that you want your audience ultimately to come away with, okay? So there are so many ways, and I'll talk a bit more about it, about how we know that there's a scientific consensus about this issue. Here are the thousands of ways that we know it's actually happening, okay? The world is in fact warming up. Here are the dozens and dozens of ways that we know that it's, it's us, okay? Yes, of course, the climate has changed naturally over millions and even billions of years. This time it's different. Uh, here are the thousands of ways that it's bad, bad right now and going to get much worse if we continue on the current path, okay? And then perhaps most importantly, uh, this last item, which is that there's hope, okay? That in fact, we have the solutions at hand. This doesn't in fact require us to invent cold fusion, though if anybody on this, uh, 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 in this uh, digital uh, room has cold fusion at your fingertips, please call me, uh, I would love to know about it. But we don't actually need it right now. We have all the solutions we need to actually uh, address this issue. Um, and I would just say that as an aside, uh, we in the climate community, I think, have done a pretty poor job uh, historically at helping people understand what those solutions are. We've done a much better job explaining that this is a real problem and is really dangerous. Um, and there's a rich, rich psychological literature around what's called efficacy, okay? That it's not enough to understand that there's a threat, though it's vitally important that you understand the threat, but it's also important that you understand that there are things that you can do, okay? That, that, uh, that there are things that can be done, that you have the ability to do those things. And most importantly, that if you do them, uh, it will make a difference, okay? So anyway, these are the, the five key ideas that we think uh, everyone should at least have as a base shared understanding. So given that, how are we doing in the United States? Okay, how, how are we doing? So what I'm gonna start showing you now are results from a long scale uh, a longitudinal set of studies that we've done called Climate Change in the American Mind. Uh, we started this over a dozen years ago, and every twice a year, every spring, every fall, every spring, every fall, we do a nationally representative survey of the American people uh, and uh, to really try to address where are Americans in all kinds of different dimensions. And I'm just going to talk about a few here. So first of all, how about where are we in terms of it happening? So what you're looking at here is, if you look over on the far left, is uh, where we started back in the fall of 2008, when uh, public opinion had reached a kind of a high watermark uh, in the 2000s. So in 2008, 71% uh, of Americans understood that global warming was happening. But then you'll see this big, massive drop, a 14 percentage point drop, bottoming out in 2010. Uh, and if people want to ask about that in the q and I'm happy to do so. I'm, uh, it's a great story, but I'll keep moving on for now. And since then, it just kind of slowly, slowly burbled its way along until really in just like the past five years, we started to see a real uptick, which I'll come back to in a moment. And as of last April, which is our most recent uh, survey, we're actually just about to go into the field with a, our next survey, uh, literally next week, um, we're at 73%, okay? All time high, okay? So yay, that's great, America. Woohoo! we're at an all time high record. Well, to put that in context, if, if we were talking about Japan, it would be about 98%. Okay. Um, so we clearly have a long way to go. Um, but still, small wins, we're at 73%. Okay, but how about human cost? Well, again, not so good. So here, as of last April, 62% of Americans understood that global warming is human caused, but 29% said, no, it's still mostly natural. Now that's in a really important uh, misunderstanding because if you think it's just a natural cycle, okay, Earth gets warm, it'll get cool again. Uh, it's nothing we have anything to do with, nothing we can do anything about. Um, 
then it's very hard to support a whole range of policies that are really needed to address the root cause of this, which includes, of course, getting the carbon out of our energy system. Uh, and of course, land use change, which is tied to all kinds of things, including our food and agriculture uh, system, among many other things. So why would we need to do things like put a price on carbon if it's just a natural cycle? So this is an area where Americans still do need uh, uh, to get more engaged. Okay. Well, we also find uh, that many Americans still do not understand that there's an overwhelming scientific consensus about the fundamentals, okay? Is it happening and is it human caused? This isn't about what's gonna happen to the monsoon in India in the year 2085, about which there's a lot of uncertainty and there would be serious scientific debate. I'm talking about the fundamental questions. Is it real and is it, or is it human caused? About which there is no serious uh, debate whatsoever. In fact, multiple studies using totally different techniques have all converged on a basically the same result that 97% plus of climate scientists are convinced that human caused global warming is happening, okay? But unfortunately, we find that only 21% of Americans understands that it's more than 90% of those scientists, okay? huge misunderstanding of this. And this is a consequential misunderstanding because what we have found in our work is that this is a gateway belief. To quote a famous political scientist, most people don't know much about most things, okay? And that's true of us all, okay? I know a lot about climate change because I've been studying it for 30 years, but you ask me to assess the risks of nanotechnology and I'm probably not all much, much better than most lay people, okay? So, we're all in this boat. We're facing a world that is filled with new and harder to understand risks that are hap happening all around us. Um, and in that context, we all look to experts to help guide us, to help tell us, don't eat this berry, this will kill you. Uh, this is safe to eat, okay? Um, and that's very much the case here for climate change. And so most Americans are still confused. They still think the scientists haven't yet reached a conclusion about the fundamentals of this problem. Um, and that therefore many Americans kind of get stuck in this wait and see attitude. They're basically saying, hey, scientists, would you go off in a room somewhere and argue this out and figure it out? And you know, if it's a real problem, you'll come tell us, right? Not realizing, of course, that the scientific community did that literally decades ago, okay? So why is this, why is this such a low number? Well, there are three major areas. So the first is science itself. I mean, it's not our day job. <laughs> Uh, many scientists weren't trained how to communicate effectively. Um, and moreover, it's not what we are supposed to be doing. I mean, I will get zero credit towards tenure if I try to publish paper after paper after paper that just simply repeats the fact that gravity exists, okay? My job as a scientist is to go to the frontiers of knowledge, to push the edge of our knowledge, to, to try to answer the questions we don't yet know. And yet that's not what most people need. They still need to know the fundamentals that yes, this is real and human caused, okay? So one, just science isn't well set up and frankly, scientists just aren't big, don't have enough of a megaphone and never will to communicate at scale. We're talking about reaching seven and a half billion people. So don't put this all on the scientists, although science does play an important role. Second is the media. For many years, the media, uh, 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 basically used a, a, a traditional political norm in reporting called false balance, um, which basically is the norm is in politics. If you hear about something from a Democrat, then you wanna go check out what the Republicans have to say about that same policy, okay? Just, you wanna make sure you're hearing both sides. But unfortunately, too many reporters applied that norm to science, which doesn't, doesn't work that way. You know, you, you wouldn't, go do a, a, you know, a story about the new, uh, the astronauts that just reached the, the uh, space station uh, and then say, well, we really need to go consult somebody that claims that the earth is flat. Um, nobody would do that. And that's an, un, uh, it's an inappropriate use of a political norm to try to report on climate science. And unfortunately for too long, uh, news organizations would do things like CNN used to do this all the time of you'd see two panelists, right? One is an esteemed climate scientist uh, who's not a particularly great communicator, by the way. And the other is an industry hack who looks great. He smiles, he's well-groomed, and he's got his talking points down perfectly, okay? And so the lay person at home is looking at this and they're going, well, geez, it seems like it's 50-50, okay? That's because of the, uh, the inappropriate use of that norm. 
uh, which they have gotten better at, by the way, in the past uh, few years. But then the last piece that we have to say, because it really is probably the most important part of this, is that this particular fact has been uh, the direct target of a massive, very well uh, very sophisticated, very well funded uh, propaganda campaign by the fossil fuel industry and associated industries. Because what they quickly understood, and this goes all the way back to the tobacco wars, they understood, and in fact, if you look at the tobacco documents, uh, the, the legal documents that were gotten out of discovery, it's right there that their strategy was doubt is our product. They realized decades ago that they didn't have to convince Americans that smoking was good for you. They just had to convince Americans that the science was still unsettled. We're not really sure whether it's good or bad for you. And in that context, Americans would keep smoking. And the companies literally raked in billions of extra dollars into their pockets over decades because they sold that particular message so well. That exact same strategy, that exact same message was lifted root and branch right out of the tobacco wars into climate change, including some of the exact same scientists who used to say that smoking is not good for you or isn't uh, harmful, are the same scientists who were then arguing climate change isn't happening, or it's not human caused, or it's not a serious problem, or it'll even be good for us, okay? They have, I, I mean, I, as a communication scientist, I have enormous respect for what they did, although I feel like it's totally unethical and, and has uh, led us to the precipice of real, real danger. But as communicators, they were good. And they're still good because many Americans have not yet understood that there's in fact a consensus that this is real. Okay. And then we get to this measure and this really is standing in for a whole host of risk perception measures. Um, but basically what we have found is that uh, as of last April, only 26% of Americans are very worried about climate change. Yes, it's if you include the somewhat worried it's at 66%, but really it's that intensity that matters a ton. So why don't we worry about this very much? Well, there's a whole bunch of reasons to this, but one of the most consistent that we've seen from the very beginning, in fact, from my very my own dissertation uh, uh, done many, many years ago now, um, that some on this call actually uh, read, um, is uh, that for many people, climate change is still seen as a distant problem. Distant in time, that the impacts won't be felt for a generation or more, and distant in space. This is about polar bears or some developing countries, but not the United States, not Oregon, not Eugene, okay, not my neighborhood, not my friends, not my family, not me. And as a result, it's psychologically distant. It just becomes one of a hundred other issues that's out there. And maybe I kind of wish somebody would do something about it, but I don't see why it's important. I don't see how it connects to my life or my values, okay? Um, and unfortunately, we still see that many, many Americans still see this as a distant problem, okay? Uh, so that too is one of those core things that we need to, to help people understand that this is happening here and now. Okay, so another way that we've tried to come at this, uh, and here's just a background story, is that for many years I would go around the country, I'd give these kinds of talks, and people say, hey, this is great, this is really useful information, you know, I, it's, it's already helping me think in a different way about how I'm going to communicate, but I'm running a campaign in Florida, or I'm running a campaign in Wichita, Kansas. Can you tell me something about Wichita? And the answer was always, no, I can't tell you anything about Wichita because no one's ever hired me to come do a survey in Wichita. I mean, no one's ever given us millions and millions of dollars to go do studies all over the United States. Though, again, if anybody would like me to do that, uh, you know where to find me. Um, so in response to that repeated question, we developed a whole new uh, technique um, that allows us to take all this data that we've collected at the national level and develop a statistical model that allows us to assess and estimate what's going on for all 50 states all 435 congressional district and 3,000 plus counties across the country. And of course, since I know there are some scientists on the, on the line, a model is only as good as it reflects reality. So we actually took the time and a lot of money to validate that those estimates against independent uh, uh, representative surveys in four states and in two cities, and then compared them against the model results. And basically they match at about 98%. 
uh, which is astounding for social science. Okay? That's almost a natural science uh, level of, of validation. So what does that allow us to do? Well, I got to just say that as a, a scientist, and let me just give you quickly, here's what we would normally see, right? You can say, all right, um, uh, adults who are worried about global warming, 63% in the country. Okay, great. That's helpful. But it really doesn't help you much if you're working at a state or local level. Um, getting this has been kind of like, oh, like a biologist who gets a microscope for the first time. Like we suspected there were critters swimming around in the water, but we couldn't see them. Okay, so now with this tool, we can suddenly see the variation across the country. And so here's what you see when you go down to the county level. And what you can immediately see, and by the way, darker red is uh, more worried and darker blue is less worried, is that there's a lot of variation across the country. Americans don't have the same viewpoint everywhere. There are geographic patterns, okay? And there's a lot going on in this particular uh, map, but let me just point you to one of my personal favorites as an example. And that's the state of Texas, okay? Now, most people have this kind of stereotypical image of Texas that it's, you know, it's a it's deep, uh, it's a Southern, uh, deep red state, very conservative oil state, uh, long led by climate denying governors like Rick Perry. Uh, it seems like the last place you could go to have a constructive conversation about climate change. Turns out that's not true, okay? If you look at Texas, you'll actually find that there's a lot of variation within the state and moreover, these, these counties right along the border um, are more worried about climate change than most of the counties in liberal leftist California, let alone Oregon, okay? Huh, in Texas? What's going on there? Well, it turns out that there's also another very uh, common piece of wisdom out there that climate change is an issue that only white, well-educated, uh, you know, upper income, latte sipping liberals care about. Turns out that's not true either. The group that cares the most about climate change in this country are Latinos. They're more convinced it's real, that it's human caused. They're more worried about it, okay? They're more supportive of action. They're more willing to get personally engaged, okay? And that's what you're seeing right here along that border is that Latino influence, which also then shows up in lots of other states and I think we've all just gone through a, a major election where we realize just how important that Latino vote is in certain places like Florida or Colorado or Arizona and so on, okay? So anyway, that gives you a, a, a sense of just, again, how these kind of maps suddenly allow you to ask questions that you just couldn't get at before. Now, I just wanna then reinforce a point that I made earlier about how distant many people see this issue. So let's start with uh, this question of, will global warming harm plants and animals? And overwhelmingly across the entire country, a majority of Americans in every single county in the country, I think with one exception, and that's like right here uh, in this little piece of Texas, um, a majority of Americans think, yes, global warming will harm plants and animals, okay? So yes. All right, but how about people in the United States? Hmm. Not so much. Okay, how about you personally? Okay. Big difference, okay, big difference. And this of course then influences the way we perceive the risks of this issue, how important this issue is, how urgent we see this issue at, okay? Oh, right, so let's talk politics. Why not? Aren't we all like just, we can't, we can't get enough more politics these days. So, well, it is an important story because of course climate change can't help but run into our political uh, system. So let me talk a bit about uh, what's going on with this issue. So we've been studying how the different parties are responding to this issue. And here you're looking at a question of how high of a priority should this issue be for the president and Congress? And what you can see here is that in the past few years among Democrats, this issue has soared in public priority, okay? Just a huge upward uh, uh, trend. And likewise, among independents, it's also gone up, not quite as strong as among Democrats, but it's definitely on the way up. Um, but then you see what's been going on with Republicans, and that is basically it's been low and flatlined the entire time period. Okay. So the parties are beginning to get farther and farther apart uh, on this issue, but it's mostly because uh, Democrats and independents are pulling away from Republicans who are not moving all that much. 
Well, here's another way to look at that. And uh, I know this is a very busy slide and yes, there will be a quiz at the end. So please memorize this, um, but it's actually very simple. So let me just uh, uh, explain what I'm talking about. So here we're asking specifically about as a voting issue, 30 different issues from healthcare to COVID, the economy, Russian election interference, et cetera. How important are each of these going to be in your vote? And this was for the election we just had a few weeks ago. Uh, and remember this was asked back in April. So this is uh, a little dated, but basically what we found is that among all registered voters, climate change had become number 13. And that's an all time high for this. We've been tracking this over the past few election cycles and climate change usually was down in the 20s and now it was up over halfway uh, to number 13. But it gets much more interesting when you start looking across at this broken out by party and uh, ideology. So for liberal Democrats, global warming was voting priority number two, okay? Put an exclamation point on that, underline it, bold and italics, because that is unprecedented in American political history where global warming was one of not just a top issue, one of the top issues for the base, the, the progressive base of one of our two major political parties. And moreover, among moderate and conservative Democrats, it was number eight, okay? So in the top 10, okay? And that really does help us understand what we just witnessed and what we just went through in the primary system. So if I can take you back to the spring, of all the 372 people who ran for the Democratic nomination, at least it felt like 372, um, they all were talking about climate change, okay? They all were saying this is gonna be a priority for, for my presidency, okay? They all said at minimum, the first thing I'm gonna do is get the United States back into the Paris Agreement. All the way out to then Jay Inslee at the other end of the spectrum who literally centered his entire campaign on this issue, okay? Now, I don't in any way dispute that they understand, they all understood that this issue is real, that it's serious, and that they were well-meaning and sincere in their, in their policies. But I also don't think it's a coincidence that they were all talking about climate change, because for the first time, there was a real climate vote to be had. And this is where it gets really interesting, because you get this positive feedback process. So Climate scientists always talk about positive feedbacks and it's not a positive thing. It's, it's actually often a death spiral uh, in, in climate terms where say, you know, sunlight coming into the Arctic melts ice, that, uh, that white ice turns into black ocean. So the light rather than reflecting out to space because of the ice then is now being absorbed by the uh, black ocean, which further warms up, which causes more melting, which causes more warming, which causes more melting, which causes more, uh, melting and so on in a downward negative spiral. Um, in this case, this is the political system and it's a positive uh, amplification process and it is positive, at least for the issue, in that you started to get, because uh, political leaders were responding to this signal within the primary voter, they started talking about it more. And the more that they started talking about it, the more uh, their voters heard about it and the more they started to uh, to uh, take it more seriously. And the more seriously they talk, uh, talked about it, then of course the political leaders were talking about it more and you get this spiral effect uh, between each other, okay? And that also helps us explain what happened very strangely uh, in uh, the general. So the traditional way to become president is that you run to your base in the primary because you got to get your uh, you people who will actually show primer tend to be the most, uh, you know, most liberal in the case of Democrats or the most conservative in the case of Republicans. So you got to get the nomination. But then once you get to the general election, you moderate, right? You, you change your position because you want to pick up swing voters and independents and maybe some disaffected members of the other party and so on. That's the traditional way to become president. But then you look at what Joe Biden just did. Okay, Joe Biden's plan as a general election candidate was much stronger, much more ambitious than it was in the primaries, okay? Why would he do that? Because the, that strategy has shifted in recent years where you don't simply just go for, I mean, this country has become so divided that there's so few true undecided voters left. They're almost like unicorns. And both parties have increasingly realized that the way to win is to actually invest more and more money into getting out your base. If you can get your voters, your Democratic voters, your Republican voters to the polls 
at 90% plus, you have a much better chance of winning than trying to convince somebody who's barely paying attention to politics, okay? And because of that situation, Joe Biden felt impelled that he had to come up with a stronger plan. Why? Because he desperately needed young people to show up at the polls, Latinos to show up at the polls, and suburban women to show up at the polls, all of whom care more about climate change, okay? So, and then we come, of course, to uh, the, um, the debates. And for the first time in American history, where climate change had never even been mentioned in prior debates, it was a formal part of all three debates, okay? So all I'm trying to say here is that the political, social, and cultural climate of climate change has shifted dramatically in this country, okay? Uh, not to say that it's where it needs to be and that there isn't a long way to go. There is, but it has clearly shifted. But let's not forget the other side of the aisle, because for liberal and moderate Republicans, global warming was 23 out of 30, and for conservative Republicans, it's 30 out of 30. Okay. And you can see that in that sense, this, uh, this country is more divided on climate change than it is on abortion. Climate change. So we clearly have a long way to go, especially in breaking this kind of partisan gridlock. Okay, but I don't want to leave you with the sense that, oh my God, we're just stuck in this terrible political partisanship and we'll never get out of it because at the same time, there is already a strong social political consensus around some of the solutions, most notably the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy like wind and solar and geothermal and so on, okay? When we ask Americans, how much do you support uh, energy policies like putting more research into renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power? you'll find almost nine out of 10 uh, registered voters support this, okay? Including 73% of conservative Republicans. I mean, as a survey researcher, I gotta tell you, it's hard to come up with a question that nine out of 10 Americans all agree on, okay? I dare say if I asked uh, Americans, do you like apple pie? I wouldn't get nine out of 10 of them saying so, okay? So that's pretty remarkable that uh, across the board, politically and ideologically, there already is a social consensus about one of the major solutions. Generating renewable energy on public land, 86% support, including 73% of conservatives. Tax rebates for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles or solar panels. Again, 83% support that, including 73% of conservatives. Regulating CO2 as a pollutant. You still got three quarters of the country, including about half of conservatives that support that policy. Uh, it isn't until you start requiring utilities to do things, so government telling business what it can and cannot do, that you start to lose uh, at least some conservatives, now down to 41%, but still two thirds of all registered voters. So there are ways that we can see possibly the politics get moving forward. We can have a much longer conversation of, and trying to read the crystal ball of what's uh, gonna happen in 2021, and that will be a fun conversation if people wanna go there. Um, but it's just to say that in terms of the public's permission structure for action on climate change through clean energy, that's already there. Okay, one of the other things that we learned uh, very early in our work, of course, is that Americans don't have a single viewpoint about climate change or frankly, any important issue. Um, and so then people too, e too easily divide the country into believers and deniers. Well, that's actually not true either, and it's actually not a very helpful framework. Uh, and so in our early work, we, we quickly realized through um, some analysis that we could find six different segments of the public, six different publics within uh, the American public that each respond to this issue in a very different way. So let me uh, introduce them to you. Uh, we've been uh, tracking and trying to understand them for about a decade. So as of last April, um, the uh, we, this is how they looked. Uh, the first is a group we call the alarmed, 26% of the country. These are people who are firmly convinced it's happening, it's human caused, it's serious. Uh, they strongly support action um, and they wanna know what to do, okay? So this is the potential issue public. This is a group that is passionate about this issue. They're willing to actually call their member of Congress. They're willing to go out in the streets and march. They're willing to donate money. Uh, this is really the, the core of democratic social change is an issue public, which we can talk more about if people wanna talk about that. Uh, then the next group is a group we call the concerned, 28% of the country. These are people who also are convinced it's real, it's human caused, it's serious, 
but they tend to still think of it as distant, distant in time and distant in space. So yeah, they would support action, but they don't see why it needs to be done right now. Okay, they often say, well, let's just put it on the back burner, not realizing that the pot's boiling over on the back burner. Then comes a group that we call the cautious, and you can think of them as fence sitters. Uh, is it real? Is it not? Is it human? Is it natural? Is it serious or is it kind of overblown? They're paying attention, but are still just kind of confused. Then I, an important but small group that we call the disengaged. Uh, and these are basically people who say, you know, I think I once heard that term global warming, but I don't know anything about it. I don't know what the causes are. I don't know what the impacts are. I don't know what the solutions are. So it's not like they've got an ideological or political barrier. It's literally, they just don't know anything about it. No one's ever communicated it to them in their terms through the media sources that they pay attention to. Then comes a group that we call the doubtful, 11%. And these are people who say, you know, I don't think it's real, but if it is, it's just natural cycles. Uh, nothing we have anything to do with, nothing we can do anything about. So I don't really pay that much attention to it or see it as much of a risk. And then last but not least is the dismissive who are firmly convinced this is not real. This is not human cause. This is not a serious problem. And most of them literally tell us that they're conspiracy theorists. They say it's a hoax. It's scientists making up data. It's a UN plot to take away our sovereignty. It's a get rich scheme by Al Gore and his friends and many other such narrative uh, uh, storylines. Now, importantly, there are 7%. There are only 7% but they're a really loud 7%. They're a really vocal 7%. They're more than adequately represented in the halls of Congress, okay? And moreover, we can even see that they have tended to dominate the public square, okay? They have been so loud that they've actually intimidated many people into not talking about climate change. We've got Thanksgiving coming up. Climate change has joined sex, religion, and politics as like topics that you're not supposed to talk about at Thanksgiving because nobody wants to piss off Uncle Bob. And it usually isn't Uncle Bob. Um, okay, but they're only 7%. And moreover, um, well, and just one other point about them being so loud is that, and you've all experienced this, you can go online and you can read a really well-researched and written article in say USA Today, okay, good article. And then you look at the comments and the comments will have for more of them maybe uh, uh, arguments from people in this dismissive category. So it's really easy as a member of the public or as a journalist or as a policymaker to come away with a false impression that it's half or more of the country, but it's not, they're just loud, okay? And moreover, of that 7%, the, mo the great majority of them are not actually on Twitter nonstop or Facebook and constantly doing all that stuff. That's a tiny, tiny minority of this 7%, okay? So I'm not kidding when I say that we are often letting the last hair on the tail of the dog wag the entire dog, okay? So I'll come back to this theme, but this is why it's so important that we actually talk about it because for the vast majority of the country, you actually can have a constructive conversation about climate change. All right, so just to make the further point that there are completely different conversations happening in this country all at the same time, uh, we've asked Americans, if you could ask an expert on global warming one question, what would you ask? And the doubtful and dismissive, their main question is, so how do you know that global warming is happening or human caused? And on a deeper level, why should I trust you? Whereas these groups in the middle are saying, okay, so it's happening, uh, but so what? Why should I care? What's this got to do with me? Whereas the groups over here, the alarmed and the concerned are saying, okay, I got it, it's happening, it's human cause, it's serious. Well, what do we do? What do we do? Okay, and a lot of them have that question. And I, again, this is a broad brush critique of the climate community. We just haven't done a very good job historically at helping people understand what they as individuals can do, but more importantly, what we collectively can do to address this issue. Uh, let's see, I think I'm gonna skip this and we can come back to it. Um, but let me also just say that we've been tracking this over the years. And so here's the last five years of the shift in these six Americas. So what you can see here is that in 2015 on the left of the screen, uh, basically the alarmed were tied at 11% to 12% of the dismissive. So basically there was one alarmed for every one dismissive in this country. 
But in the past five years, the alarmed has soared in its numbers until as of last April, it was 26%, whereas the dismissive had dropped to 7%. So there are now nearly four alarmed for every one dismissive. That represents a huge shift in the underlying political, social, and cultural climate of climate change. It, makes, it opens the space for conversation. It opens the space for policy discussion and hopefully ultimate policy implementation. And it just gets us closer to the point where we can actually stop arguing about is this real or not and getting on to what's the best solution. Okay? So it's just an important underlying uh, uh, shift to a more constructive environment. Okay, so last thing I want to end with is just a few examples from Yale Climate Connection. So this again is our national radio program that tries to pull from what we've learned in this research and then try to share what uh, we know about climate change with a national audience that currently is on 650 uh, plus stations across the country. So let me now shift to this. Okay, and Paul again, thumbs up. Great. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, start with just a few of these episodes just to give you a sense of how they work. Uh, let's start that over. Um, and this one actually turns out we did this a couple years ago, but it's particularly meaningful for me and I'm sure for all of you because this is about Oregon uh, and it's about the impact of wildfires. And I just can say I was devastated from the other side of the country with seeing how close the fires came to Eugene and what it did to one of the most beautiful, precious spots in the world, which is the Mackenzie River. Um, so, but what people don't often understand are the connections, right? That it isn't just the fires. It isn't just the loss of those trees. That then has knock-on effects. So let's take a listen to this one and you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm Dr. Anthony Lazarus, and this is Climate Connections. As the climate warms, the western U.S. faces more intense wildfires and water shortages. And as one problem gets worse, so could the other. Kelly Gleason of Portland State University says that after a wildfire, snow that falls in the burned area melts faster and earlier in the spring. When a forest burns, the canopy tends to get burned away. And so there's less shading on the snowpack and more sunlight just makes its way through the canopy to the snow surface. What's more, burned trees slough off charcoal and blackened bits of bark and needles. Those particles darken the snowpack surface. And because the snowpack is darker, it absorbs a lot more of that additional sunlight energy. Gleason and her team have found that on average, snowpack disappears five days earlier in forests that have burned. She says the effect persists for at least a decade following the fire occurrence. So it's extensive and it's persistent across the West. Many communities depend on slowly melting snowpack for water during the dry season. So if the snow melts too fast, it can mean dry conditions in months to come. So that's at least one example of helping people understand the science, but doing so in a locality where they can begin to make those connections to how one thing led to the next, to the next, to the next. But I don't want to just talk about the science. So let's turn to this. This is a, a, a wonderful piece that we did um, because it's about the humanities, right? This is not just a natural science problem. In fact, it's less and less a natural science problem. It is a social science problem, and it's also really a humanities problem. We desperately need the humanities engaged in this because it's the humanities that bring meaning to our lives and meaning to these issues. And it's, I would argue, is really the place at the heart that actually gets us engaged with these issues. Now, this is just one example of what I'm talking about, but here uh, is a very clever way of helping people understand, act this is using the humanities to explain science. So there, one of the things that's so concerning about climate change is that spring is arriving earlier and earlier and earlier in the season. And, you know, that has all sorts of consequences, but you know, you might think, okay, well, we'll just plant our crops a little bit earlier and so on. But the problem is that that's not how the natural world works. The natural world is this exquisitely interconnected and timed set of interrelationships between caterpillars and baby birds and you know, flowers and so on. And different species use different cues 
to uh, affect their migration patterns, their, uh, their nesting habits, and so on. And what these things can do is they can get out of whack. They can get out of balance. Uh, and so that's like a very abstract way of explaining something. But here's a way that, uh, that you can do that through music. Okay. So let's start with, this is uh, a rendition of uh, Vivaldi Spring. We all know this. Uh, it's four clarinets. And let's just take a listen. something we all know, right? And the lovely sounds of Vivaldi's spring. Okay, well, here's that exact same song, okay? Nothing's been changed except the timing and the volume. but you can tell it's not like it's supposed to be and it doesn't have the harmony uh, of the original, okay? That's at least a way that music itself can help explain things that we often can't explain very well just through our abstract words and numbers and symbols, okay? Okay, another example though is the power of narrative, okay? And I cannot emphasize this enough. I mean, for all of our fabulous technological advances and we, there are many, including our ability to have this conversation through the computer screen, okay? That is an amazing accomplishment. The, one of the single most powerful forms of communication dates all the way back to when we were sitting around the campfire and that's the story and especially the personal story. So now I just wanna share with you a story that we've actually tested and we know this actually works really well across the board and especially with conservatives. Um, but this is a personal story of someone who's seen the impacts in his own life. I'm Dr. Anthony Lazowitz, and this is Climate Connections. I'm 66 years old, and I don't ever remember not hunting and fishing. That's Richard Mode, an avid duck hunter and trout fisherman in North Carolina. He's seen the impacts of the changing climate firsthand. He says ducks are migrating later and later, often not even showing up until after the hunting season ends. The fishing has also changed. Trout require cold, clear, clean water. Places that I've trout fished in the past that used to hold lots of fish are warming and the fish just aren't there like they used to be. It makes me very, very sad. There's a sense of loss there that I cannot fully describe to you verbally. Mode hopes these changes can be slowed or reversed before more trout habitat is lost. But more importantly... Climate change is a national security issue. It's a health issue. It's not just sportsmen wanting to catch more fish. There are many, many reasons why we need to move away as much as possible from a carbon-based energy policy. Otherwise, Mode fears that the hunting and fishing he grew up with and loves will disappear. So that's the power, not just of story, but of the human voice. I mean, I want to sit on that guy's porch and just talk for hours, okay? It's just a, a, a really uh, amazing, amazing guy, actually. Um, okay, so I'm going to finish with one last musical version of how music also plays a really important role in cultural change. He said, hopefully. All right, there we go. 
Or not. Okay, well, it's not going to work, which is fine because we'll move on. But it's a lovely, it's a lovely piece. So I would encourage you to come to our website and check it out for yourself because uh, it, it's it's a very inspirational uh, 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 story. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly finish up here. Okay, so just want to conclude with a few last things. First of all, what I would hope all of us can take away is please break the spiral of silence, okay? The spiral of silence refers to this tendency that people may say, look, you know, me and Paul there, uh, I, you know, we're friends, but we've never talked about climate change. And I'd like to talk about climate change, but I don't know what he thinks about it. And because I don't want to create tension or a conflict, I don't bring it up. And likewise, he's looking at me and saying, well, I'd like to talk about climate change, but I don't know what Tony thinks. Uh, maybe he doesn't want to talk about it, so I don't bring it up. And so neither of us talk about it, and we end up in this downward spiral of silence. Okay? It is so critical that we break that silence and talk about this issue. Okay? I mean, we see that all around us. Uh, think about Black Lives Matter. Think about the Me Too movement. You know, does anybody think that issues of racial justice and injustice and you know, uh, sex discrimination and violence are new. They only been around for the past five or six years. Of course not. These are generational, you know, epic level problems. But now we're talking about them in ways that we just couldn't before. And that's so powerful because it helps people understand the experience that real people are having all around them that most people just weren't aware of. So one, it's just so important to talk about this. Secondly, know your audience. Okay, don't assume that they are like you. And this is so common to all of us, right? Um, we all just assume, look, I care about this issue. Let me tell you all about everything I know about it. Let me get you to care about it because of the way I cared about it. When that may not in fact be the right thing to do, okay? I like to say it this way. There are many roads to Damascus. Don't force everybody to walk the exact same path you did. Maybe you got to climate change because you care passionately about the polar bear. That's great. Go find other people that are passionate about polar bears and use that to engage them. But don't go to somebody who doesn't care about polar bears and say, you must become an, you know, an environmentalist like me before you can care about this. They, they can walk a different path. Maybe it's asthma in their kids. Maybe it's national security issues about being dependent on fossil fuels. Maybe it's the economic opportunity of being part of what will be the biggest single economic a transition and amount of money made by somebody to create this planet we want to live on. Okay, there are lots of different roads. Okay, don't force everybody to walk yours. Your job is to walk with them, hold their hand, and help them move along their own path. Uh, that there are these six different Americas, and think about that because they are starting at this uh, to talk about this issue from completely different start starting points. There are no formulas. Number four here. But this is a really helpful guideline, and that is simple, clear messages. Repeat it often, 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 at least seven times by a variety of trusted messengers, including you. This is a disease among academics. We all think, hey, I said it once. I wrote it down in a, and published it in a journal article. Didn't the world read it? No, they did not. Um, and then uh, back to where we started. Scientists agree, it's real, it's us, it's bad, but there's hope. So please come to visit us. Uh, we, have all, we make all of our uh, research available as well as uh, all of our Climate Connections episodes. Uh, so please just surf on over and uh, check us out. So thank you. Thanks, Tony, for that fascinating conversation. Um, would you uh, could you stop stop sharing your screen? Sure. So um, I want to invite people with questions to enter them into the chat box, and then I will share them with Tony. Tony, uh, uh, one question came through uh, very early when you showed us the chart that showed that precipitous decline in um, in two thousand nine ten. You want to tell us why that happened? Sure. So yeah, great question. So uh, so yes. 
climate change was kind of surging in the 2000s, uh, kind of hit this high water mark in 2008, um, and then it falls off the cliff. And so many people look at that and they go, hmm, what was happening back in 2008? Oh yeah, the economic recession, right? The economy's stupid. Nope, that's not what it was. Uh, we actually looked at that very explicitly. People who lost their job did not change their views about climate change. People who lost their home values did not uh, change their views about climate change. No, it was not the economy, stupid. Um, then people think, oh, maybe it was shifts in media coverage. No, it wasn't that. Uh, maybe it was some cold weather. Uh, you probably don't remember this on the West Coast. On the East Coast, we had this little thing called Snowmageddon. Um, no, it wasn't that either, okay? It really was one clear signal, and that was the rise of the Tea Party. So just to put that in a little context, because it's really important to remember that the nominee for president of the United States of the Republican Party in 2008 was Senator John McCain, who for years had been one of the primary champions of climate action in Congress. Okay? And in fact, he ran on climate change. He said, climate change is real, it's human caused, it's serious, I will address it with, my, with our conservative principles. It was in the Republican National Party platform taking action on climate change was in 2008 but he loses. And when Obama takes power, one of the reactions that you see is the rise of the Tea Party. And you see the entire Republican Party in the space of 18 months go from saying, we care about climate change, we will address it, to suddenly going way out on the last twig on the longest limb away from the science where it became a common talking point to say that climate change is a hoax. And that had a really big impact on the on the lay public in the Republican Party. It's in political science terms, we call this political elite cues. That basically is a fancy way of saying that when leaders lead, followers follow. And unfortunately, we're seeing that right now with mask wearing in COVID, right? We actually did a study on COVID back in April when the CDC first came out with its guidelines about wearing masks and Americans across the board Democrat and Republican immediately went out and started buying and wearing masks. But as we've seen, it's become politicized, intensely politicized. And now it's a marker and of uh, an litmus test of political identity. And that's now, unfortunately, literally killing people. So our next question uh, is, is, the questioner asks, um, I noticed that concern seems to be higher in fall than in spring. Do you think this is from forest fires? That that's the reason for that. Uh, I don't think it's from forest fires alone. I do think that it's at, it is, we, I mean, we're not positive about this. It's one of the many things that we're looking at, but we think there is a bit of a seasonal cycle in that fall is on the heels of summer where people experience uh, and have been unfortunately experiencing increasing record heat, um, but also then all the spate of extreme weather disasters, which includes fires, but also includes hurricanes and you know lots of other extreme weather. So uh, we do think that's at least part of it. And then of course, spring is on the heels of winter, which for many people, they still have, again, goes back to most people don't know much about most things. They have a very shallow understanding of climate change. And so they often uh, associate it with just rising temperatures. And if it's cold outside, then they're less likely to think it's as serious of a problem. So uh, the next question is from our colleague, Alexander Murphy, who says, as one of those who did read your dissertation, it's a pleasure to see you back, even virtually. One of the clear communications challenges is the spatial separation that exists among the communities with some of the different views you highlighted. Any thoughts about how best to transcend that separation? Yeah, that's a, that is a great question. And this is all part of what uh, has been called the great sort, right? That Americans increasingly are separating themselves into different cultural enclaves. Uh, so even, you know, a few miles apart, you can have a, just a world of difference in politi politics, culture, uh, et cetera. Um, look, I think the best answer to that is to localize. Uh, in fact, I think this was a basic mistake that we made in the community from the very beginning. And it's totally understandable. It's because there's a reason why we call it global climate change right? It's, it's the kind of thing that you can only learn about as a scientist by studying what's going on globally. But that's also the frame that we went to people all over the world and said, we want you to now care about global climate change when most people are intensely local. They don't spend time thinking about what's going on in countries far away. I mean, Alec knows better than all of us. I mean, um, there are Americans who still can't identify the Pacific Ocean on a map. Um, 
I mean, we can laugh, but it's also because they, they don't need to know. I mean, they just live intensely local lives. And so when scientists and environmentalists parachute into these communities and say, hey, we want you to really put aside everything that you're already struggling with. We need you to care about this global problem. It's like, and by the way, we're talking about it in parts per million and all kinds of other jargon. I mean, we might as well be aliens from another planet. So I think this, it's so important to localize it, to help people understand that this issue is happening right where they live. And in fact, it is happening everywhere, if you just know where to look, or that it connects to something that they already care about, okay? It's not just your geographical location, that's one way in, but more importantly is that it's something that you already care about. And there too, we have so many opportunities to connect this issue, and it's why we call it climate connections, because this is all encompassing. I mean, it's, I, I call climate change the policy problem from hell, because you almost couldn't design a worse fit for our psychology or our institutions of decision making. But one of the few advantages it actually has is that it's so all encompassing. I mean, we're talking about the climate system of planet Earth. It's the life support systems of our entire planet. Um, that every human being has a direct and real stake in the outcome of this one. So it just means we need to break out of the science box. It's not just the science, it's not just about environmentalists and it's not just about liberal politicians. But I would just say it's one of the most exciting things that's been happening in this entire field uh, or this entire issue in the past 10 years is all the new voices that are coming and speaking up. Business people, doctors, nurses, restaurateurs, uh, business people of every type, you know, military folks, people of faith in every, um, all of the world's religions, the Pope Francis uh, with his encyclical and he was late to the game. So, I mean, there's just so many new voices and that's, I think what we really need to be amplified. So speaking of amplification, have you studied how effective climate change marches on, on bringing climate change to the attention of the six groups you talked about? That's an interesting question. So a little bit. And so, um, so I, I mean, some of this is actually still in peer review, so I can't talk too much about some of it, but just to say that it, I think if you think of it in the Six Americas framework, and this is an example of where it's really, really helpful, the march, and I'll just speak personally, for the march that was in New York City a few years ago, 400,000 plus people, uh, I was there, my wife was there, my son was there, um, you know, and I've been to marches before, um, but there was something so experientially powerful about being in this endless sea of people. And these were diverse people. I mean, like of all walks of life in every stripe who had come from all over the country to participate in this. It was an incredibly inspiring experience because you got to see, and it goes back to what I started off talking about, that power of what we will call social norms. Right? To be surrounded by lots of people who care as passionately as you do about an issue is an incredibly powerful thing. We, Aristotle himself, himself said that we are social animals. We are constantly looking to take signals from everyone around us. And for far too many people, they have felt isolated and alone when it comes to this issue. They've gotten increasingly worried, but they can't talk to anybody. They can't even talk at Thanksgiving about it. And they don't realize that there are in fact millions of people who are as worried as there are. There are about 70 million Americans who are alarmed about climate change. But you don't have a way to see that. And that's one of the, I think, great values of a march is that it tells, it tells everybody in that march, you are part of something way bigger than yourself and thus far more powerful than yourself. So I think it does play a really important role for that. It also can drive media coverage and it's a focusing event. It becomes an event that draws more people uh, to it, depending, of course, what happens at that march. So sometimes those marches can be, um, you know, uh, have a backlash effect. Uh, so it, there's nothing inherently uh, always going to be positive about what happens in a march. But anyway, I think marches do play some really important roles, especially for people who are engaged with the issue. Uh, what would you like to see more of in climate change communication through documentary films and the media? Mm. That's an interesting question. I mean, there's just so many of them now. Uh, I, I get calls like once a week from people who are making films. Um, I think it, in the end, I want to go back to and why I was really using Climate Connections as the model is that it works. 
It's about connecting this issue with real people, not just scientists talking heads, okay? Not just environmentalists who are saying, you know, do it for the planet. Uh, not just, you know, liberal politicians who immediately turn off half their audience. Um, hearing from everyday people who are both struggling with the impacts of climate change right here and right now, but even more importantly, the stories and the voices of everyday people who are rolling up their sleeves and taking action. I just, I mean, I will speak personally. Again, I've been doing this for 30 years. And until we did this radio program, I, I had no idea of the thousands of people. We've told over 1,500 stories now in the six years, the amazing things that people are doing. I mean, they're just so inspirational. They're so gritty, uh, you know, from at every level, from technological advances to chaining themselves to bulldozers of taking this issue on and doing what they can. And again, that gets back to what we were just talking about, the power of a, of a rally or of a march. The same thing, it's about storytelling, which of course brings us back to the humanities. So you've, I mean, I think you've sort of answered, you've been answering the, these two questions that came together. Uh, the first is how do you get people to take global warming seriously enough to be willing to change their behavior? And what barriers do you think exist that keep concerned Americans from translating their knowledge and concern into action? Yeah, there's a great question. Okay, so we have actually studied this quite a bit. And uh, and it's true both for uh, two of the more important behaviors. Uh, so we look at all these different behaviors, but I'm just gonna single out two. One is going back to where I started of rewarding and punishing companies for their action, because that can be a really powerful signal, but also political behavior. What leads people to, be, to get engaged, to actually demand that the system change? And so we've asked people, what are the barriers preventing you from doing either of those two things? And it turns out it's, there's a lot of potential things that they could answer, but there's one answer that overwhelmingly is the dominant answer in both domains, okay? okay. And that answer is no one's ever asked. No one's ever asked. It's that stupid, but nobody's ever asked. And most people, they like, I need somebody around me to ask me. I need an opportunity, you know? I'm not gonna go out and do it all by myself, but if somebody says, hey, will you come with me to X, Y, or Z? Or will you do this with me? Most people will be like, yes, I would love to do that. Okay. So, you know, we're not really that far away from being able to do some really important stuff and actually get millions more people involved in this. And in fact, the movement has been growing and growing, and that's in no small part in recent years, thanks to the incredibly hard work of young people. Um, but this is not a young people's problem, okay? Uh, sorry, old people, you, we don't get to, you know, say, okay, kids, you take care of it now, uh-uh, no. And in fact, any political campaign will tell you they, the, mo the type of volunteers they want most are young people and retired people, because they're the ones with the time they have the time. And in many ways, I think it's the older people that are the even more valuable because they also have a lifetime of experience and skills, right? And in some cases, uh, talent and money that they can put into these things in a way that young people are still trying to get their feet on the ground. So, uh, so yes, there is a, an enormous need for people to get engaged, but it starts by asking. The next question uh, refers to the work of George Lakoff, who speaks about people's frames growing up and taking them into adulthood and their view of politics. Yeah. Um, does that apply, that approach apply to the way people think about climate change and uh, uh, how you can speak with people about it? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a huge one. And, you know, one of the great pleasures I had at U of O was studying with Mark Johnson of Lakoff and Johnson. So, uh, in fact, I did my master's degree looking at the metaphors we use to understand nature. Uh, so no, these are, these are really important and they can be really important uh, framing uh, and language really can matter at times. Um, so like is climate change a, an environmental issue? Is it a political issue? Is it a moral issue? Is it a social justice issue? We've actually asked Americans that and they overwhelmingly say it's an environmental issue. Okay, but they don't see it as a social justice issue. Okay, B 
because we haven't communicated it that way. And yet it's an enormous social justice issue, right? The, the injustice of the way that the, especially let's just take the fossil fuel industry from the mining and drilling and extracting to the transportation, to the refining, uh, to the end use of fossil fuels all hit people of color and low income uh, folks first and worst. And I haven't even gotten to the impacts of climate change, okay? So it's all the way through. And yet most people don't understand that because they still think, and I'm overgeneralizing, this is about polar bears, okay? It's not, we, it's not about penguins, plants, and polar bears. This is ultimately about people. So um, can you tell us what countries are doing the best in communicating and therefore believing in climate change? You mentioned Japan earlier. Yeah, um, best countries, uh, how, how to pick my favorite. <laughs> um, I mean, we're working with a bunch actually that are very actively engaged in exactly this. So, I mean, one country that I think is actually really interesting is Costa Rica. Um, Costa Rica, there's not just a national consensus, they're moving to 100% uh, off of fossil fuels, uh, it's pretty soon, like um, by 2030 or something like that. Uh, they're blessed with hydro resources, which is not unlike some state I'm thinking of in the Pacific Northwest. Um, but the point is, is that they've already committed to that. Um, uh, Ireland, we're actually working with the, the Irish government right now um, to do, and again, it's not just about communicating policy, which is the usual thing. They're asking the big question, how do we engage the Irish people in solving this, because this is not going to be solved just through government regulation or new policies or technological advances alone. I mean, let's just take the United States. Uh, we need to electrify everything. That means including converting your, you know, I'll take the average American, the two gas cars that you have in your driveway and converting them to electric. It's about swapping out the uh, furnace that's currently running on oil or natural gas and switching it in with a heat pump. It's you know buying 100% clean electricity or putting solar panels on your roof, right? It's insulating and weatherizing your home. Those are all the things that we need to do at mass scale to address this problem. So there's a consumer side of this. There's a demand side of this as much as there is this top-down uh, kind of policy piece. And increasingly societies are recognizing that the only way they're gonna solve this is to marry the top down with the bottom up. Uh, so the next question is from Patty who identifies herself as another person who read and shepherded your dissertation. Taught me everything I know about survey research too. And the question is, what are you using as your main source of survey research these days? Oh, what a great question. <laughs> so it's actually the same source that we started using over a decade ago. Um, and uh, basically, when we started this Climate Change in the American Mind project, we saw a couple things happening. One is the rise of the internet, and the internet is a fabulous way to gather data. But the second thing we saw is that traditional survey methods, most notably telephone surveys, response rates were plummeting. Okay, it's just answering machines, voicemail, you know, there are so many new ways that people can just basically say, I don't want to talk to somebody on the phone. Uh, and we can have larger conversations, and I'm sure Patty has her views too, about why some of the polling has gone wrong uh, in the elections lately. And I think that's at least part of it, is just that we're not able to reach some of the parts of the, of the uh, American public that we haven't been able to, that we've traditionally been able to reach through telephone means. But in our case, we decided to go with uh, a company that's the first and still really one of the only uh, ones that started by actually building a representative group of uh, panel members by going out uh, and importantly, you know, this is why I would ask everybody to take internet surveys with a grain of salt, is that there's still about 10% of the public that doesn't have a computer, okay? So you've already basically said, here's 10% of the public's views that you're not including in your surveys. And guess what? They tend to be older, they tend to be poorer, they tend to be more minority, or they tend to be uh, disaffected, very conservative rural men in some cases. So you're not getting those, those attitudes. So in this case, the company we decided to, to work with went out and actually drew a representative sample of Americans. And if they didn't have a computer, they gave them, they, they gave them training. Here's how we want you to use this. And so we've used that same basic platform consistently uh, over the years and it's expensive, but as we kind of see, you get what you pay for. So the next question is from Mike Schill, the president of the University of Oregon, who's joined us. Great. 
uh, you've mentioned the importance of young people getting engaged. How should we be guiding our students' engagement? Was a lawsuit like the one our current student, Juliana, brought effective in mobilizing opinion? Oof. Well, those are two really big questions. Um, so look, I mean, what's the role of the university in society is, is the ultimate question to that. Uh, you know, is it simply giving people technical skills that they go out and get a job and, you know, and that's really the job of the university? Or is part of the responsibility of the university is to, is to educate citizens? Okay, and I mean this in the broadest sense. I'm not just talking about climate change. I'm just talking about the role of the university in the life of the Republic. And I mean, of the many lessons that we have been forced to confront over the past four years, the vulnerability, the fragility of our democracy, of our civic society, and I'm not throwing stones here, I'm just saying our ability to have a reasoned discourse with one another is fraying and it all collapses without that. Okay, the founders knew that themselves. Um, it's why Abraham Lincoln in the midst of the Civil War goes ahead and does the land grant uh, educational system because they knew that bringing that kind of education uh, to the mass uh, population would be critical to maintaining the very institutions that uh, we all depend on. So I, I don't wanna be too grandiose about it, but that is really the one of the critical roles of a university. And I would be desperately asking, what are you doing to help uh, make and help students become active citizens in whatever form that is, okay? They don't have to all become advocates. They don't have to become activists, but that is a form of engaged citizenship. But there are many, many others, okay? Um, ethics, let's come back to humanities. What are the ethics of being a lawyer or of being in you know, sports marketing uh, or business or a chemist, okay? Or a music major. What are your, what are the ethics? What are your responsibilities to the larger society of which you're part? And especially at U of O, this is what you taught me so well, your responsibilities to the natural world of which we are inseparable. So I gotta just say, if U of O can't do that right, then we're all kind of screwed. <laughs> yes, the value of liberal arts education, amen. So the next question, what effect might our rejoining of the Paris Climate Accord have on the national level of concern for the issue? Would this be an example of leaders leading the masses to a meaningful treatment of the issue? So I, look, I'm a big proponent. I've gone to many of these international negotiations. Uh, it's really important. It, it will also help the United States rejoin the family of nations and perhaps one day to lead again uh, as a credible leader. Uh, of that of that global effort because it takes a global effort, so I think you know rejoining the Paris Agreement is going to be vitally important, uh, not just because of the targets and so on that we need to commit to as a nation, but because in the end we need to do this with everybody else on the planet. You know, in terms of the general public, I got to say most people don't really pay much attention to international treaties. That's not going to be the thing that galvanizes most Americans. Um, again, they're just not paying attention. Okay, they probably don't even know where for sure what country Paris is in. I hate to say that, but there are definitely people who don't. Um, I just don't think that's going to be ultimately the way that they engage this issue. Most Americans wanna know about America or they wanna know about Oregon or they wanna know about Klamath Falls. What's going on here? Why are these extreme events happening right here? Okay, you guys just, you just live through something that the entire rest of the nation experienced vicariously by just seeing all those incredible images and hearing the stories of people all through the Northwest suffering through those fires, okay? Just horrific. Um, that was powerful, okay? Those stories are powerful and they're gonna be even more powerful because you're gonna continue to live those stories. That's the episode I just said, just looking at what it's gonna do to, to water availability for a decade to come, okay? So anyway, how, how do we help people connect the dots? So Tony, it's now a 6.30 our time, 9.30 your time. How are you doing? Do you, are, you, are you running out of steam or are you willing to take a few more questions? I can take one more. Okay. I'll lose my voice soon. Okay. So this one is related to the point you just made. Um, after several decades of catastrophic storms in the Gulf of Mexico, the, speak, uh, the, the questioner would think more residents of the Gulf states would be more convinced that the intensity and amount of rainfall from these storms are a result of warmer 
Gulf water, waters. Your demographic map seemed to disagree. Is this attributed uh, to education level of the affected areas or the fossil fuel industry that employs many of these communities? What insights do you have on that? Yeah, that's such a good question. Uh, so this is something we've been studying very intensely for a decade. And that is, let me reframe the question. What's the role of direct experience in shaping public responses to the issue, right? Uh, I mean, many scientists, in fact, have been saying at some point, right, the heat waves are going to get bad enough or the fires will get so outrageous that everybody will just like go bing. Oh, yeah, climate change. Let's go do something about that. Uh, it's not that simple. Human beings are way more complicated. Um, and I just, I would just say that we, in looking at this, um, we are just now starting to see the signal of that direct experience starting to emerge out of the noise, okay? We think it's just starting to happen because people aren't starting to clue in. To clue in. They're like saying, what's going on with all this extreme weather? Like, how many one in a thousand year events do you have to have in a three year time period, right? Does this have something to do with climate change? So the question is emerging in people's minds, but they're, people are not like Pavlov's dog, okay? It's not like ding, you get hit with a flood and suddenly you just go, oh, there's climate change. That has to be interpreted back to humanities. It's about bringing meaning to those events. Okay, people don't just experience a flood and immediately connect it to this abstract, difficult to understand thing called climate change. Somebody has to do that for them, okay? Um, and it's that role of bringing it, not just the meaning, but I'm gonna say making it meaningful, okay? It's the full part. Like, it's not just about engaging the head, it's about engaging the heart because it's the only way you're gonna engage the hands, okay? Um, Again, why we need not just the natural sciences, but the social sciences and the humanities. Because we have to appeal to the entire human being. So I would say, look, if you want to understand what's going on in those Gulf states, just ask what party people are. Okay, I mean, still the politics is dominating this. Um, but we are beginning to see that signal of direct experience emerging. And I think the breakthrough, if there will be one, is when you start hearing, in particular, Republican leaders talking about climate change, talking about how it's already impacting their communities, and even more so, here's how those solutions are bringing benefits to our communities. And it is happening, okay? I don't wanna leave you with the sense that this is just horribly, we're never gonna be able to agree about this, because you're seeing all kinds of promising lights within the Republican party Though God knows we don't know what's gonna to happen to it uh, after January. Um, but nonetheless, there are a lot of Republican officials at state and local levels that are already talking about this, that are already benefiting from the transition to the clean energy economy and so on and so forth. And then I'll, one last point coming back to the president's question about young people, because another question I always get asked. So are, you know, where are young people on this? Are young people really leading the vanguard on this? And for many years, we actually just didn't see much of a generational signal at all. We are starting to see one in just the past few years, but it's not what people often think. Uh, because when you look below the surface, you find that young Democrats really are no more engaged with this than older Democrats. Okay? Young you know, kids today, their parents, their grandparents, they all pretty much agree that it's happening, it's human cause, it's serious, and support uh, policy at about the same levels. The real difference generationally is within Republicans. Young Republicans are much more engaged with this issue than are their parents and grandparents, especially their grandparents. Okay. That's really interesting. Um, likewise, uh, Latinos. Uh, we saw that Latinos are a diverse group. They are not all the same. And some of them have lots of Republican leanings and in fact voted Republican in this last election. But they also care about climate change. Um, is that another way that begins to change the political calculus within that party? Hey, look, my crystal ball is cloudy about all of that, but it's just to say that I think there are some encouraging signs out there. And maybe that's a hopeful place to stop. Well, uh, I think it's a lovely place to stop on that hopeful note. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony Leiserwitz, so much for this fascinating talk and conversation. It's been such a pleasure. I wanna thank everyone who joined us today. 
For more information on other upcoming uh, virtual events sponsored by the Oregon Humanities Center, or if you'd like to contribute to supporting our public events and research programs, visit ohc.uoregon.edu. Thanks everyone for watching.